So I thought we'd just start out, I, I posed that question to them. Why do we need Laramie? Um, what, what do we gain and why this play, why now? So I'm gonna let them talk a little bit and then certainly we'll open it up to questions and comments from you in the cast. So you know, to go to my left, as I like to do. The far left. Oh, um, you know, I'm at, I come in and I'm wearing sort of two hats in this conversation because part of my uh, of my identity is also that I'm a Northern Baptist minister, which after seeing a play like this is always a little bit hard to name out loud. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that is, uh, it's part of what I bring with me and, and recognize that my investment is, uh, is in these institutions of education of, of schools and churches where I, I see both as playing these huge roles and the questions that get raised about sort of um, how do we raise up kids, how do we, in a space where this can happen. Um, so that was, um, it, so it feels important that we keep asking those questions. Um, that a lot of what I think this show addresses is sort of how do we, um, as communities, uh, think about uh, what it is that, that we're putting out there um, and how we're, um, what are the messages that we're sending, what are the values that we are trying to negotiate. Um, and, and so I think it's incredibly important in that moment. I mean, there's a, it's certainly, the incidents that are reflected in the story are significant to me and part of that is because of my age and where I was at the point in my career when all of the Matthew Shepard stuff was happening, which was right as I was graduating from college and starting a career as an educator. So um, after having been a, a big uh, queer activist on campus, um, so there was um, that idea of sort of a, a public conversation and what I really appreciate about the show is that it invites uh, a, a public discourse and kind of takes that seriously. So, uh, so I want to thank the cast and production yeah. team for their work. Uh, I'm just, um, impressed. <laughs> I, um, I spent three of my three years in social services working for the LA Gay and Lesbian Center and during that time I worked for an anti-violence program and that program was enabled by the death of Matthew Shepard so we received federal funding and there was a lot of uh, groups receiving federal funding after Matthew's death because it created all of this public discourse and made people aware and also it made people want to do something so that was 99, I think that program started. It was the first volunteer in service to America program that had an LA, or sorry, an LGBT focus. Um, I remember working in LA five years after Matthew's death, we had a, a vigil, another vigil. And I think it said in the play, it says there's 5,000 people in the, in the initial candlelight vigil in LA, right? And five years later, there were 15 with a couple cameras. So for me, I always think of that when I think of why do the play, where is the social memory for, for these kinds of events? That's always been very salient to me because there were just a few of us standing on this corner with the, park, with the little inscription to Matthew Shepard on the plaque. And that was it. And people had already in that short time already forgotten what had happened. A couple years after that, when, when Bush took office, we would lose all our federal funding for these kinds of programs. So there was a big, I mean, it was, a, this for me was quite a, a formative production in terms of my life decades <laughs> as well. But uh, it also, it, I'm always reminded when I, when I see this of uh, how important it is to keep this course going. Um, I, I, guess, uh, I guess it goes, it has to go back for me just a little bit to the, to the mid 90s and uh, I'm also artistic director of Mad Bites Dog Theater and I, I ran across a strip uh, by Emily Mann called Execution of Justice, which was about the killing of Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk in San Francisco in 1978. And it was a piece of documentary theater, and I was just really fascinated by it, and the company put the play on, and I think it stuck in my mind how powerful a piece of documentary theater could be to engaging a dialogue um, and with a community, and, and that was something that I was hoping that our theater was doing. Um, I saw this play in New York uh, when it was originally done by Tectonic and I came back immediately and thought that, that Man Bites was the right company in this area to, uh, to do this play and, 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 and 
for a number of reasons, the rights got sort of shifted and we were unable to do it. So it, as a director, it sort of stuck in the back of my mind on my wish list <laughs> of plays that I wish that, that, we, that I could direct. And, and because Man Bites does all contemporary work, um, the fact that it had been done in this area two or three times already sort of took it off that wish list for me to do professionally. So when I was asked to direct this spring, um, I submitted to the student group here on campus, uh, the, the Duke players uh, who support the Department of Theater Studies uh, main stage shows, I submitted to them a list of five or six plays, uh, and on that list was The Laramie Project. And um, I, was, I was overwhelmed by their positive response about it. They had what I understand was a very lively debate. The, that the, the fact that the students themselves in 2009 were discussing this script, were reading this script, were saying, yes, we want to do this script. Um, that was my inspiration to, to, to want to continue to be a part of it. And it's only been proven out by the work that we have done since we cast in, in, in August. Um, we've been working on the play in, in one way or another. We've, been, we've had a class that's been going since the 1st of January and then went into rehearsals. Um, in March, and it's it's been this really incredible dialogue, and I've gotten to know my students in a way that I would never have gotten to know them, and I think they've gotten to know me in a way that uh, they might never have gotten to know me in, in a regular classroom situation either. Um, I think also there was this amplification that happened in the fall uh, when the uh, gay suicides all of a sudden, you know, these things go in cycles, right? And all of a sudden there was, the, the thing that was really happening and brought to the forefront was this, this rash of gay suicides, young teen gay suicides, and that led to the It Gets Better campaign, which again was very, very positive. But, but it made me really happy that we were going to be dealing with a play that dealt with some of these issues, and I felt like it was not so far away from their experience uh, as students. And um, I've been teaching here 30 years, and um, uh, so I've sort of, you know, I've sort of seen the waves of, of everything come and go. And, uh, you know, it's only been really recently that, 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 that students feel free to come out in a classroom in a discussion. A student uh, this fall, you know, just announced to the rest of the class that um, they were gay. And, and, and that's, a, that's a new kind of freedom. I mean, that's a new kind of, and I like to think that, 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 that Theater and plays like this have somehow contributed to opening up that dialogue, and that students on our campus feel safe and to be able to to be who they are, and that I feel safe and and honest about being who I am as well. So I think that also played into it for me. I'll, what I think is in the program, <laughs> um, I, the program note basically deals with why we why we do this play now, in addition to. Some of you might have picked up a timeline, which I feel is now, it seems to be a, a great um, kind of archetypal thing to produce in relationship to this show, not only because of sort of filling in the history, um, but also taking a moment and trying to um, remember that it, it might have, there might have been only 15 people in the, in the next five years for Matthew Shepard, but there are other moments in time where there, there have been constellations that are connected to Matthew Shepard's death and the dialogue that happened there that are re-emerging and, and, and starting to wake people up again, or tendrils of connection, especially we had looked into specific North Carolina connections to Matthew Shepard and finding out that Matthew Shepard was a student at Catawba College his, that was the first place that he had enrolled in 1995 or 96, um, and spent a year there and was interviewed for the documentary film Dear Jesse on campus with his boyfriend, talking about homophobia and racism in North Carolina. Um, and Kirkman, Tim Kirkman, who's a, not based in North Carolina anymore, but still does documentaries, um, he released his film to festivals in uh, June of 98. Matthew was dead in October, and he realized he had this footage 
of Matthew, the only video footage that we had ever really seen of Matthew Shepard, um, and sort of went back to that. And re when Dear Jesse was re-released as a DVD, he included that material um, in there. And we were able to sort of find it on YouTube um, and, and take a look at it, which was really sort of one of the first moments that we had, both connecting this play to North Carolina, thinking about him being here, and what was the legacy of North Carolina of, for LBGT people and students, and, um, and, and what, how we could sort of touch on that um, as a production without changing anything. And that, I, I was in Raleigh, uh, I was a senior, I went to NC State, and I was in Raleigh the, the spring that he lived in Raleigh was my senior year, and we hung out at the same club. Um, so I, I met I met Matthew several times. Um, we weren't close friends by any means, and uh, but we had we ran in a similar circle of friends. And I, I remember it wasn't I didn't know his last name, and it wasn't until a couple of days afterwards because it was Wyoming that felt removed um, that I realized that it was it was Little Matt that I had met. Um, and so there was a very strange experience of, uh, in fact, it might have been on the day of the vigil that I learned that it was him, um, of being in the vigil in Raleigh, um, you know, where I had, like I said, I had been a campus activist and we had received death threats rather frequently. That was sort of the experience of being a queer campus activist in the, in the early 90s, was that, at least, in, um, and I remember that, you know, we would kind of, catalog the death threats and we would put them and you know we would call the officials and then we kind of just kind of move on and it, it, there was this incredible moment um, and the piece that really spoke to me in the in the show was um, that sense of going like uh, remembering differently like mm -hmm. oh my gosh this was real like this it, it was this like I suddenly had this panic <coughs> of the last decade um, that I had kind of trained myself never to feel as it was going on that I suddenly felt for the first time. And I think that's part of why it became such this sort of crystallizing moment, um, is because there were these people that had kind of lived with this, um, trying to pretend that this wasn't, that this couldn't really happen, that, it, that suddenly that was all undone. Um, so that was that was part of my experience of, of it. And, and then going and then seeing these people that I knew had known him and had known him fairly well during that time. And he was in with your So I think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we're, it, it, every night, and that's part of the structure, I think, of having the cast all around, and you notice nobody leaves stage um, from the moment you come in to the moment that um, we have the time in between the acts, but they're always there, they're always watching. Every, every performance is hearing the story again. And I think we've had conversations as a class about how it strikes you differently every time and you're hearing something else and then every time, I mean, the play requires that of us. Matthew is dead from the beginning. He's reanimated through the first act and we hear his sort of slow, um, you know, coma reports in, in the hospital and then he's dead and then we have the trial and, and sort of having that, to listen to that every night, I think, putting the actors on, you have to watch them listen as well as watch each other listen in terms of the way that we have this staged. And I think that's one provocation, because sometimes when the play is done, and a lot of documentary theater does this, it's very much about talking directly to the audience, which has, a, a, I think, a dramatic impact, but not necessarily, I mean, sort of objectified. So you watch us have a memory, um, but over there and sort of made into a comfortable proscenium box that is is far away and I don't I think it's you can't get away from it as much um, in in this and we watch each other across the uh, the stage space as well as watching the actors and um, I know that's one particular choice that was made by the production team to try and like, remind us all to be in a, in a community together um, every night which I think is well, I'm glad we're going to have a few days break. <laughs> in some respect, <laughs> not to lessen to the impact of that, but it is, it is, uh, I think it's a rather grueling uh, affair. So, uh, I don't know that anyone, do you have particular questions for them or the, 
past. I mean, I think this question of why, that the play has been done again. They went back to Laramie in 2009, that Connick did, and they spoke to people about have things changed. And the result of that was another 90-minute play, <laughs> um, and basically discovering that not a lot. I mean, the Matthew Shepard um, and James Byrd Jr. hate crimes bill was signed into law in 2009. That's a federal protections law. There is still not a law in Wyoming, not a law in North Carolina, specializing crimes against um, gays and lesbians and transgender people. So there is this notion that, yes, there is. there was the dialogue and there was I remember sort of being struck by how many people wanted to talk about it, including my parents, who weren't really apt to talk about being out, and, um, and, and all confirming the worst of their fears, right? That something was going to happen to me. They didn't care what I was, but that the world would not understand, and therefore, as a parent, wanting to be protective of that. So how to negotiate that, as I kept trying to tell them that if that was their fear, then they needed to talk to people. <laughs> they needed to change the circumstances that is the way they could under which I was going to live. Um, uh, so, so that was a, a kind of dialogue. But in 2009, they, they went back and had a conversation. And, and they've just now been touring the Laramie Project with the Laramie Epilogue in the east uh, of about six theaters across the country this past fall. Um, and then again, there did sort of be the, the rash of reporting of Tyler Clemente and kids 11 and 13 and 15 taking their own lives because of either um, bullying because they were out or gay perception, right? So people being teased beyond bearability um, and, and thinking that, you know, the violence isn't, isn't overt, right? As they sort of live and let live, although I call you a faggot, um, that is still very resonant in the play. Um, it just sort of happened to be in the news around the same time that Tectonic was revisiting these questions. So in some sense, we haven't. We've come very far, and we've not come far uh, much at all. Questions? I, um, I just wanted to say that I thought the entire production was amazing in speaking to this idea of how things change. Like I'm, I'm a native of Charlotte, North Carolina, and I remember Back in 1995, I think it was, when they were going to put up Angels in America, and everyone just went berserk, mm -hmm. and they were protesting it, and they cut off funding to the Arts and Science Council, and um, my mom had to be on board. To, you know, my mom was from New York City, so she was like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> even like an issue, and like, I remember them explaining it to me, and then I remember being in school, and the response I got was very different from, from my home environment, which was one of urban tolerance that, you know, we certainly didn't learn. But um, you know, Charlotte has become very much a, a sort of a tiny little blue city and a very red state, um, and it's cool to watch that change. But a big result of that has been uh, overturning Angels in America. <laughs> it sounds like a big law thing. But they eventually were able to do that performance, and it sort of set a, a course of, of um, that kind of theater being supported in Charlotte. And so I think about this at, at Duke and how, um, you know, I think a lot of people here see so much intolerance. I, I have been, I see it as a very tolerant place, but certainly opened my eyes. And I just want to say, I hope that the, as I graduate, I, I don't get a chance to say anything like this, but I hope that the theater department um, with the funding I don't know how much funding y'all even get, but <laughs> I hope that the, the theater and the work that um, we continue to do um, hopefully stays in this direction. I know it kind of can be like beating a dead horse, but I don't think it's a dead horse. I think it's very much something that needs to continue to be addressed, and I just really appreciate all of the incredible performances, and I hope, I just hope that this keeps going, whether it's in Hoof and Horn or Duke Players or any little theater company y'all just want to start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Speaking of which, you know, things, have, things I think have changed over the last 30 years, and I'm, it, it, like all change, I think it, it seems incredibly slow uh, when you go back and look at it. But um, uh, I was so fortunate this, uh, this spring to see the Me Too monologues, which were all monologues written by students, and they were just... <laughs> <laughs> Putting a plug in for you guys. I appreciate that. Um, they were. They, 
They were <laughs> phenomenal. And uh, two of the members of our cast are going to be leading that effort next year. And Three. And they, three, sorry. <laughs> they and they are great. Uh, are, are going to be leading the effort to, to give a voice to students who, who somehow feel uh, feel as though you know they've been disenfranchised or, or that, 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 that uh, uh, those that there are still things that they want to talk about on campus. So I, I hope that that continues in large ways and, and, and in small ways. Uh, I saw that production in Charlotte and I walked through a picket line in order to get to the front door. Um, and uh, it was uh, like it, it was it was pretty. You, you sort of you sort of had to sort of wake yourself up and say, you know, I'm in the I'm in the end, you know I'm at the end of the at the end of the 20th century, and, and this is still you know this is still. Though I will say, 21st century. Mecklenburg County Commissioner, and he's quoted in that timeline, just this last year made a pitch against continuing AIDS funding in the state for people whose lifestyles brought it upon themselves. Mm -hmm. So there is still a narrative of, of you know, and, and, and complained because Charlotte, and Charlotte passed just this last year a very specific statement about gay and lesbian tall, and I'm not sure if it's called tolerance, but that's sort of the way it was because they're hosting the Democrat National Committee, uh, <laughs> right? They're hosting the convention next year. Um, they beat out other states and, and the sort of blue state, the purple state space that North Carolina sort of inhabits now. Um, and the same commissioner was sort of like, they did it on purpose to pander to the Democratic Committee because we all know that that's, you know, here, um, uh, that's just not the way, that's really not what North Carolina is But like. I do feel that it really rides on, on our, our generation so much because I remember in my school, my white private, upper, 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 upper class, whatever you want to call it, school, there were kids who came from, from those families, and they were like, I don't think that, right. you know? So I think a lot of it's riding on us to keep doing this, so. Well, and that may help to answer the question, is there, you know, why, why to continue to do this? Mm -hmm. if, a, if, a, if, a, if new generations, if it's a play that's going to have any kind of enduring message, then new generations discovering it and uh, deciding that it's a story worth telling is seems to me to be at the heart of what theater is about. So. But that said, I would also say, I mean, some of the messages I think in the play are quite disturbing to me yeah. in terms of like what it promotes and the kind of focus it gives to hate crimes. Because yes. ultimately, hate crimes legislation. I mean, having worked on this for a long time, <laughs> you know, it does. It doesn't. It doesn't achieve what you want it to achieve. No. Like, it, I mean, I think the idea is that you pass a hate crimes law and then people's attitudes will change. But there are laws against murder, and people still murder people. So, I mean, there's, there's something about the, the way that it gets, all the focus becomes on passing hate crime legislation, and not on things like, oh, how about including LGBT materials in, in the curriculum from K through 12, mm -hmm. things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? so, you know, those kinds of issues are, can be more of the focus, and they, and they get kind of sidelined because the focus is so centered on hate discourse, which is, right. Right. the law can only do so much. It's a punitive measure after all, right? You increase punitive damages to, be, right. to perpetrators with hate crimes law. And it's still over, the, someone has to die right. in order to be recognized. Or seriously hurt. Or seriously hurt, right? I mean, it, uh, the same way with visitation law that President Obama signed recently, um, of people not being able to visit loved ones in the hospital because they were not considered married, so that woman was not able to be seen by her entire family while she died in a Florida hospital because they were there on vacation and the hospital wouldn't let her partner and her children come in and see her, right? And, I, and, and it gets a lot of attention because it's sort of like, wow, that's really wrong, that shouldn't happen. But the underlying circumstances under which that happened and the change that had to happen so that people can live with rights, um, that's, that's the harder question to have, that's the harder sort of space to tackle. But I think what struck me in the production as I think about it afterwards and why it's constantly relevant is it was very little about the motivation, the specific family life of the two perpetrators. And it was really about a community environment and the breadth of attitudes that creates something like that. And I think just simply seeing it, you know, forget, as you said, the legislative issues. Um, and go back and forth on that for a lot of reasons. But it's the underlying change in community attitude and holding up that mirror of, you know, what am I portraying? What am I not portraying? What is my religion, you know, portraying? 
um, that I think makes plays like this very timely on a regular basis just because, oh yeah, be reminded of that. <laughs> and it, I mean, it sounds like a subtle little bit, it's, very, it's critically important and to present it probably earlier, we, we were talking about that, high schools are not trying to do that. Yes. And you know, that provokes a lot of fascinating conversation about, I'm going to say this, forget the gay lesbian issue for a second and just about parent-child relationships because think about the kind of dialogue you're going to have about you know, what is my kid doing, why am I doing it, what beliefs do I pass along or not pass along. Absolutely. I think I'm stunned that, I mean, when it was done here professionally at the big regional company, it was, again, everybody was sort of, it was their big, um, Gay play, I feel like we could say that. Because um, they weren't going to do anything in America, right? They'd seen what happened in Charlotte, and that was not what that was not what was going to happen. It was still, and this is 2002, right? So it's it was still not in the end in the triangle. So so that was what was gonna that was gonna be the play. But now I'm hearing people saying ninth graders are performing in it. I mean when I was in ninth grade. Naomi was in it, and I just absolutely thought. I mean, yay, <laughs> in, in some respects. But it's a, I also know I went to a conference in September and in Australia it is included in a packet of documentary theater. They have a sort of track you can do in college on documentary theater performance in connection to social justice. And uh, Angels in America is in there. And it is part of that curriculum. Um, so it, it, it was wonderfully uh, fascinating for that. Um, to know that, that was, it was going to be able to reach um, an age group that was, you know, even at the very beginning of high school, not let alone college, right? That it's become a sort of regular diet um, in there, and, which I think, can, you know, it's going to, is going to eventually, and as I mentioned, it's going to help change it, bring a new generation and have better conversations with parents and children. Um, so yeah, so I was in it in ninth grade, and it's been really interesting to, to do it all over again. I play completely different characters, and I've learned completely different things. Um, and I guess what I've learned from that is that it needs to happen then, and then it needs to happen again, <laughs> and again. <laughs> um, and I would be in the show again. Um, I hope to be in the show again at some other point in my life. Um, and you do, you learn completely different things about it each step of the way. And, and when I was in it um, back then, there was no one in the cast who, um, who was out um, as LGBT, and it had a different feel for that reason. Um, and, and this time around, going through it um, as a cast with, with people who do identify in that way and with, with our wonderful, wonderful leaders who do identify that way has, has brought it to levels that I that I never could have, have known possible. Um, and, and back to the issue of it being on this campus, the most, I, I tell people that I'm in it and they ask what it's about and every single time they say, oh, oh, <laughs> oh it's about, it's about gay people. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a homophobe. I, I'm more, they, okay, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of keeps over and over and over, and, right? <laughs> and every time, it's like, oh, this isn't just another rock musical, this is about gay people, and I don't hate gay people, so I will be there. <laughs> and we're taking rules. <laughs> Uh, the whole guy hates bad uh, friend. 
gay friends who are Christian, and I've seen the whole Fred Phelps thing prior to any involvement in the Larry Project, and it honestly it turns my stomach in order to have to stand up with a guy hates fag time and point at people in the audience and say America is doomed because of the fag and the fag and the fag neighbors, and to just think that this man is uh, supposed to be promoting Christianity, and I'm a Christian, and it's just like. You're like the very opposite of what Christianity is. Like God is about love, and it, it literally, it, I, I really resent the fact that I was given. <laughs> And I mean, being in a, in a drama program, being in a drama class in high school, 
school, a lot of people were definitely, you know, LGBT, uh, LGBT already identified, and being in our time, it was, you know, we, we all loved each other and had a great time. But I, for some reason, for me, it never struck me as something that was that strong of a, of a problem, you know, mm -hmm. that this close to, to, you know, when we were still alive, like, and so, I mean, it really, it just wasn't something that I had thought about, and reading that play really, yeah, changed everything. And I did the monologue, I did Reggie Foodie's monologue. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, when, when Jeff held auditions in God knows when, August, I, I didn't know what I was doing in my semester, so I did an audition, and I was so upset. <laughs> So I decided to, to be a part of it some other way. So started doing set design and lights. Been. So Manny, Ben, Jacob. I first encountered the Laramie Project shortly after it was produced by HBO and the Virgin. And um, it was just a really interesting point in my life in that I knew there was something going on with me and I didn't know what the word for it was. And the Laramie Project introduced this word game to my vocabulary. And so not only did I sort of learn from the Larry project that yes, I am gay, but I also learned that I could be killed for it too. So needless to say, that delayed my coming out for years. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know, like, it, there's just a lot of personal connections I say with, with this play and my own personal relationship with the arts. And so I heard that it was, you know, happening here. I just had to get involved in somehow and, and I would say that whereas last time around it helped me realize my sexual orientation, this time around it's helped me re realize my love of arts and theater. Mm -hmm. So that's my connection to this one. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I guess um, <laughs> um, uh, um, I guess to return to the, the question of why why Larry Project and so um, this is something I've uh, maybe this will be the subject of my third blog post, something I've struggled with during the course of this show. Um, uh, in conversations, actually, with Jenny and I went to the same high school, we had the same drama teacher, so I was talking to her over uh, one of the breaks recently about the Lamy Project. And one of the things that I find problematic about the text is that it doesn't have, it, it's, a sa it's safe to me in some respects. It doesn't talk about you know, you don't see, I mean, it's really, there's not, it doesn't deal with issues, and I was late, I don't know if this week no. so no, 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 no. deal. It doesn't deal with issues about love and about sex, right. and that, in, in the ways that Angels does, about, the, I think the monologue that, that, that does it is a Jedediah's monologue where he talks about, um, you know, I, I, I don't hate homosexuals, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna discriminate against them, I don't understand it, but that's, you know, whatever. Uh, that is sort of the message of the play, kind of, is this, this sort of, um, it's a teaching text for high school students about don't say the word fag or dyke, but model the incredibly pedagogical, and intensely so, and inappropriately so in a theatrical piece, the red <laughs> Catholic monologue, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But um, that's there, that, oh, you shouldn't say this, this is the message of the play. It's not in, in ways, ways that angels is not, or ways that even execution of justice isn't. I guess the, so my problem, I'm trying to deal with this, um, is what is, uh, I guess, it's 10 years, it's 10 years later, and there, there's that too, that there, the violence is different now, but it's also, it's, it's, uh, it's surface related. Um, I don't know, I, I find that problematic. Um, I don't know if you could uh, respond. Um, I actually also didn't know about this Shepherd thing until last year um, when Jeff asked my new players council to look at some plays um, that he was thinking about putting on. And so we, we read them, we looked them over, and just like, <laughs> it was like, ba boom. <laughs> and so like, we read this play, and it's like, this is real, this is something that's really applicable, and here's why I think we should be doing this. Um, and it has just, and each of us has our own growth and struggles, um, personal and the group um, that's putting this on. For me, it's been like a it's really growing experience of knowing what theater can do and how it can how it can shape people and move people. Like um, just the experience of like this weekend, starting to share it with an audience and like passing along the story to you guys is it's deeply moving. And I hope you guys carry it with you for a while. <laughs> ben, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to address. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't I didn't want to lose Ben's point, which is I which is I think that that. 
Sean can probably speak to this better than I can, but, but that, that theater needs to continue to strive to better that. Uh, that, that, that there are ways in which this is outdated, and there are ways in which this play becomes romanticized, I think, in a way that's probably not particularly... Nostalgic. Nostalgia, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, uh, so, so I, I just wanted to validate that I think that, 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 that that's very, very, very much there. And I think that, you, that one needs to continue to search for playwrights and texts that, that, that explore the topics and keep it, keep it alive for the audiences in, in different ways. And make them. Make, and make, make the theater. That's right. That's, that's right. I mean, as you as you look at what as you, as you look at what's not there, you you know there's a there's an opening there for any of you to to, to make that. Go, Jake. I guess two things two things from my experience um, with the play. The first thing is that just in general, I've been very pissed off when I tell my friends like, oh, we're doing the Larry Project. Like, oh, what's it about? And I can't just say Matthew Shepard, and they'll be like, oh. You know, I wish I kind of I wish that our generation understood the Matthew Shepard murder mm -hmm. enough that people could just say, oh, well I should see that. And it kind of immediately jumped into that reaction that Naomi was talking about. Um, so that's been really frustrating, because then I was like, oh, well it's about Matthew Shepard, who's a gay university Wyoming student, blah, 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 blah. And like, you know, go through the whole thing. And then they're like, oh. <laughs> I want that immediate reaction. I want the name to kind of bring that out. And hopefully as we um, move, at, move forward as a movement and we start incorporating our, I, our community into the historical framework of America, that will start to happen. Um, that is my hope, we'll see. Uh, the second thing that's been really interesting for me, as someone who identifies as queer now, um, which is kind of a new thing for me, but you know, uh, someone who doesn't really perform gender very, very normatively anymore, um, working within Brechtian space has been really interesting. Brecht is a, is a philosopher of theater slash playwright slash you know, theorist, does all this great stuff. Um, and the whole idea of Brechtian theater, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, I'm trying to make it concise, is the idea that, uh, you know, when you see, when, when we're not trying to imitate people, like, I'm, when you see me as Dennis Shepard, I'm not trying to convince you that I am Dennis Shepard. You're supposed to see that I'm an actor playing Dennis Shepard and realize that there's a dialogue between those two things and that it is all the richer for that. Um, so, <laughs> As, as part of that, we're playing, in a way, ourselves. We're playing Duke students as ourselves. But I had, like, I, I mean, before this, like, before I started the play, I was wearing this wonderful silver nail polish, and I wear lipstick often. And, like, you know, I, I had to take that off for the show because while we're being Brechtian, it was, it was something that might have been so distracting for the audience, it might have completely removed them from realizing what Matthew Shepard's going on and emphasized too much the me and not enough the Dennis. But then I had this kind of conflict of, well, is that different than someone saying like, oh, well, you know, just take off the nail polish and lipstick for, for a job interview, and then you can go back to wearing it. Or like, is that, you know, is that different from, from because it, it sort of accepts the audience's marginalization of that thing. You know, the audience, it, it accepts the fact that the audience is going to be uncomfortable and says that is a legitimate response, and we're going to value that response over your kind of individual sort of expression. And, and so I don't know, I've had a lot of struggles with that um, over the course of, uh, of the course of this production. But you know, not in like a kind of angry way, because I mean, it's there's, I'm just too like busy to get angry. About it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's been something I've been thinking about. Uh, so that's been something that's been going on with me. That, that you know, is not as pertinent to to my sexual orientation, but very pertinent to my gender identity and my gender performance. Yes. yes. Um, I'd like to 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 take the question and twist it just a little bit, only because I'm fascinated by the idea of docudrama. Mm -hmm. Whatever you call this genre, is that the correct? Documentary theater. Usually, documentary is like a two fictional is in front and document yeah. in the back. But because <laughs> I, I'm old, I'm old enough to have seen this suddenly rise. Whether it's, yeah. it's drama or writings, people walking around collecting, doing one-person shows, yeah. putting on different faces of, of things. Whether it's Watts or Rwanda or it's, okay, whatever. And so, I guess my question: Why? documentary theater, is it for the people who died in Rwanda? Is it for the people in the villages in Rwanda? Is it for the theater people, because it's a fascinating artistic experience to pull all that together and try to make real life out of that? Or is it for all of us to think about? Or is it all of those things? And um, I, I'm fascinated by that question in terms of, of the Laramie Project. I, my initial impulse would say that it is, it is for all of those things, and that's one of the reasons why it becomes a very beautiful, frustrating process to figure out 
who your audience is. Because your audience, as we've discovered, your audience is yourself, right? So we know who Matthew Shepard is, but we don't know who Matthew Shepard is. We know what Tectonic has collected of Matthew Shepard, but there's oh so much more, right? <laughs> as we have researched and found out. And how much of that is relevant to doing the text, then we also can anticipate our audience might have this awareness or not awareness. And we're at Duke as opposed to Durham School of the Arts that did it a few years ago, or at Clay Campus. So anticipating those audiences and what, how we can still work within the same text, it's the same 80 pages, right? But make choices from the very moment, from casting to design to the acting style and uh, the performance itself, and then these post-show discussions, right, that try and capture as many people as possible, as well as making sure that we're learning, but we're also questioning. We've had the great opportunity to ask some serious questions of the ethics of tectonic through this process. Um, actors who were not ethno ethnographers, usually theater people aren't, right? There is a strand of, performance theater that is based in ethnography, it's more anthropological, it is more deep in relationship to the, the histories that are taken and more complicated and certainly theatrical, but it sort of walks the line between theater and lecture, right? And so um, those pieces are done with a different set of attentions as opposed to what the Tectonic Company did. And other companies in their way, lots of people yet have been making this entree into documentary, partly because we, the assumption being that documents are somehow objective, that interviews somehow in, in, inform the audience that they were collected uh, with a negotiation amongst that, right? We don't ever hear tectonic, I mean, we, I think five times, five or six times, we hear tectonic ask a question. More, more than likely, what it is is someone just offers information. So we don't have any sense of what the frame was like. But the play implies that we do, right? So it is of taking a process that might have been very fraught and layering that notion of objectivity, which we as a cast have found out we've had to question. At the same time, I don't think there's anyone who would want to take issue with what the play is trying to do, right? We have to sort of accept that that was the journey and that is the text that is in front of us. We, don't, we aren't going to change that. Um, it, at its core, right? But we are going to change lots of other things around that. Um, I would also say that for me, what the frustration or the, and this maybe touches on Ben's point is, documentary theater has a tendency to sort of like, well, we have the play. So we have the Watts play, and we have the gay play, and we have the Rwanda play, and the plays just get circulated over and over again. Well, that's what I wonder about the other, the other gay people who have been murdered and don't have all this exactly. wrapped around them. Yeah, but the issue is the same. Yeah. Right, exactly. So this is, so the, it, documentary theater is born out of, I think, an investigation, a crisis moment that we want to look around and sort of go, how did we get here? What, what has pulled this moment out? Um, let's try and understand that and try and help our audience understand that. And then it has a way sometimes of just kind of becoming history and, and getting sort of passed along, uninterrogated, and the difficulty for groups to sort of go, okay, that was that play. Now I'm gonna go to my community and start asking these questions. And what is the play that comes out of that? Mm -hmm. So in some sense, I always wonder, techno Tectonic would, has given us this magnificent play. I sometimes wish they also gave us, and I think they did, the urge to go make more plays, to confront those events, for artists to gather together and sort of say, we have a responsibility to, to do this. Um, in this particular way. Okay, Jenny and Ben, and then we're all going to dinner. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. oh sorry. okay, so yeah, to answer your question further about who's the audience of this play, one of the most interesting things I thought that we found out, um, we talked to Maude Mitchell, who was one of the original Tectonic members who went to Laramie to collect interviews and everything. And uh, I asked her actually what, what it was like, or because she didn't perform with the cast when they went back to Laramie but she was still friends with them, so she knew she had talked to them. And I, I just thought that was so bizarre, like, like you know, Kimmy's character says, so weird, like, to have, to play people that are still alive, that are still talking, that are, you know, still have this memory, memory to carry, and to go and perform for them themselves. You know, it's, it's, it's such a weird, you know, infinite mirror kind of thing. Um, and, so yeah, so there's pl you know there's plenty of audiences that need to hear this. Not 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 just the Laramie community, but like our community 
now. Um, and like uh, Jules was talking about, uh, you know, the things that, that aren't said and the things that aren't covered in the play, um, another thing that Maude told us was one of, you know, they were editing which interviews to put in the script and which not. And um, since this is a show that's focused so much on the Laramie community, not necessarily individuals, but you know, what, how the people are raised, what they think, that's what we were talking about earlier. Um, and she was telling us that, she, you know, that one of the interviews that she was really pushing for that she did was interviewing a battered women's shelter, a woman who runs a battered women's shelter. And the year before Matthew's murder, there were three murders of women in Laramie that didn't make it into the play. Because, you know, it's not that it's not important, it's just that it's not about the incident. And it's not something that's going to, you know, it's, it's, but I mean, how do you deal with that, you know? Because yeah. clearly Laramie has more problems than just homophobia. And it's, it's, it's all <laughs> and it's not just Laramie. And it's everywhere. It's not just Laramie, exactly. And so you, you just can't put everything in one piece of theater, you know? <laughs> and then you hate Eileen Ankin, you know, you hate Eileen Ankin's line. I think the gay community took this as an advantage, said it's a good time to exploit this. <laughs> but, you know, to an extent, there is, no, there is truth in that Maude, as Maude said, she, Moises wanted this to be about Matthew as a gay student. He didn't want to get into the other stuff, right? And you know, in the collaborative process that they that they had, that was what he chose to focus on. Um, and I wouldn't use the word exploit, but I would use the word focus. <laughs> oh, my husband and I came up to see Kimmy, our daughter, in the play, and we're very, very glad we did. I just. Um, say coming into this space from a very different culture and society, Jamaica, which is still very, very strongly homophobic um, and has a long way to go. It's been very interesting to see the performance. I'm very active in the human rights movement in Jamaica and we just lost a battle to have um, inserted in our new constitution non-discrimination um, on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, and last year, the gay community had the first of their public stands um, for uh, gay rights um, without major incident. Um, and I think when you say, you know, why do we need Laramie? In part, it's because battles are fought and need to be refought and refought and refought and and plays, as you've already said, need to be put on at one point where it's a very different play and you put it on again and it's again a different play because of the context and, and the people coming to it. And I just feel that it is important to keep doing that because that's, those are the steps that go forward. As you said, not the hate, leg anti-hate legislation necessarily, but that the conversation here is a very different conversation than it would have been 10 years ago, or it will be 10 years from now. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's been great to have been able to be here. I sometimes wonder, though, what Kimmy is going to do coming back into the Jamaican situation. <laughs> I'm not living there, I'm sorry. <laughs> In all of what you're saying, and I think this is that, that the theater is a, is, this is a fancy academic word, but the theater is a liminal space, right? It is something that sort of exists for a moment and in between worlds, reality, non-reality, inside and outside, and it, it has a tendency to feel ephemeral, right? We do it and then, right? It goes away. I, I think we've tried this semester, at least amongst ourselves and what we try to do to the campus community and then beyond that is to try and have a place and there's a URL in the front of your program. You knew I was going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> where the students have been blogging, where we've made our rehearsal, trans our re rehearsal research, conversation, everything from notes but to serious, I think, um, theoretical considerations and considerations of identity open and available in conversation and trying to tie it to other moments so that it, A, doesn't feel like it's all just a run up to the performance and then we go, whoo! Um, but that also, that is the, the next question is sort of like, well, what do we do with this? What has happened? What is lasting and concrete, right? Is that Julian's written line? Um, that can come out of this. And if it is 
a commitment to doing more plays like this, a commitment to working with companies who are trying to make theater out of everyday life and ask difficult questions and, and have a, a, a deeper conversation about things that are left out of here. That, that seems to be at least one space we've been trying to do it, and not just in the classroom, but to think that that classroom is an open space that people can come in and out of as much as we're then asking them to be here for the play. So, um, so that, I, I would say, if you had questions or wanted to know more about what that is, that's the site to where we continue to try and have our conversation. But thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.